Good morning. To say there is considerable anxiety throughout the fishing industry in British Columbia about what is now happening is putting it mildly to say the least. The other day, I brought you the Fishermen's Union, the Trollers, and the Gill Netters. Now, here's the man who matters. Here is Romeo LeBlanc, the fisheries minister in the federal government at Ottawa. We're going to leave aside the speculation and normal political chit-chat this morning to go at Mr. LeBlanc on issues like this. What's going to happen at the Dixon entrance in the southern trench of the Vancouver Island? Are the Canadians going to get what the fishermen feel is their rightful fish? What's going to happen on the halibut? What is happening on the halibut? What's going to happen on the herring fishery? Will there be any herring fishery next year? A uh, concerned member of the public might ask, or are they ripping it off at $1,250 a ton regardless? What about the new licensing proposals from Saul Sinclair? Is there really a danger that the little guys on the West Coast, the trawlers, the traditional fishermen are going to be squeezed out by the multinational corporations and the big unionized seners? That and a dozen other key issues. But before we get to Romeo LeBlanc, or rather after we get to Romeo LeBlanc, we're going to have a change of pace at the end of the program. It's open house at UBC this week, and in my continued admiration for the hallowed halls, you are going to meet some of the, I can't say brightest, but they're no less apathetic than perhaps than most of the students at UBC. These are not members of the faculty, but these are the healthiest inhabitants of the campus, and in a bright little walk around, you're going to meet the sheep and the more important people at UBC. But first this morning, for an hour, with Romeo LeBlanc, on the fishing industry in British Columbia. <music> Romeo LeBlanc is the Federal Fisheries Minister. Mr. LeBlanc, you would, would you agree with my introduction that uh, there is considerable concern among all the working sections of the fishing industry that your border negotiations ain't going very well and that there are other aspects of the fishing industry about which everybody is very unhappy? Well, I certainly don't disagree that there is concern. I'm concerned, too, because uh, fish, contrary to trees or mines, uh, tend to move uh, around boundaries, doesn't matter where you set the line. And that's probably why, if you get a good fisheries agreement, uh, you can probably adjust to any line if the fish, uh, in fact, can move but be caught on a... How long on a management system, not on... Uh, How long have you been negotiating for this uh, agreement on the West Coast? And I'm talking now particularly about boundaries. Two years since the extension of jurisdiction. How come you were able to come to what seems to be a reasonably amicable settlement on the East Coast, with the boundary issue going jointly to arbitration, and here on the West Coast we seem still to be fighting like cat and dog? Probably because the West Coast fish uh, are, the, are the type that move around much more. For East Coast, the issue was really scallops, which don't move a great deal. And George's Bank, where we had a traditional scallop fishery, and a very important one, uh, could be dealt with uh, more easily. Uh, salmon interception, you know, has been discussed for, well, certainly since I, before I was minister. You're looking at, what, 10, 12 years, because we're trying to find a way to not to take too many of theirs and they not too many of ours. That complicates that issue very, very badly. But and also, you have two complicated boundaries. Yeah, with Dixon uh, Entrance. Dick, and Dixon Entrance, and of course, uh, the Juan de Fuca area. The southern end of mm -hmm. Vancouver Island in the trench. Yeah. yeah, but who runs this, to be quite blunt, Mr. LeBlanc? Is it external affairs playing games with other pressures, or do you negotiate face up with the fisheries interest in the United States? Oh, no, we negotiate the fisheries agreement with the fisheries interests. There's no, no external affairs pressure on you. There is external affairs presence because whatever uh, negotiations succeed, there has to be a ratification process in the United States. In other words, the American national government has a, a more complicated ratification than we do. Uh, but the fact is that our negotiators are aided and very much helped by the toughest and most experienced negotiators that external affairs has produced. And you know, Marcel Cadieux, when it comes to negotiation, is no slouch. Will you go for arbitration on the boundaries on the West Coast? If we can't reach an agreement, we may have to. But uh, the fishermen here say arbitration is damnable because we'll lose that the Alaskan boundary, and uh, well, and the Americans will probably get half of what they want, and that we Canadian fishermen object to. They'll be fishing our fish in Canadian waters. Do you support that position? I prefer a negotiated settlement. I prefer uh, to have every um, advantage and disadvantage on the table, and at one point you make a judgment. Are you close at all package. to settlement? 
On the fishery, I think we could uh, probably move on the halibut, but that's an issue which we will surely want to discuss. On the uh, salmon, I think we're seeing more light at the end of the tunnel, but it's going to be a very long process. What, another year? I think it probably would take at least six months to Will get Will fishing there for just take place within national boundaries now then, for this coming season? For this coming season, unless there is an agreement ratified, yes, we would each be in, uh, in our zone and nobody else would uh, go into the other guy's zone. Can you explain for me, or simplify the halibut uh, fishing? Canadians have traditionally fished the majority of the halibut up off the, in the Gulf of Alaska and in the Bering Straits, right? Have you concluded that agreement? Well, we have an agreement which has been referred to the two governments. We are looking at it. In fact, I had a very lengthy discussion with uh, fishermen and uh, processors last night. But you know, on the halibut, we have, uh, you know, uh, the Americans know this, so there's nothing uh, betraying by saying it publicly. We don't have the strongest hand in the sense that it's fish which we were taken totally in their zone. And under the treaty, which goes back 50 years, uh, with a uh, notice, I think it was a year or two years notice, they can terminate the agreement. Terminate Have they the done treaty. that? Yes, the, the treaty will be terminated by April the 1st. So that just means that the vast... Unless we have an agreement uh, to allow a phase out. But basically the Alaskans want us out of their fishing zone. Well, don't some of them say that we have fished out their halibut with our bigger and more efficient boats in Alaskan waters? Well, that sounds like some of the things I hear about Canadians saying that the Americans have fished us out. The fact is that uh, we both fish very hard because these are very lucrative fisheries. Well, not that lucrative now, the halibut, is it? The halibut was last year. Now, this year, with the phase down, obviously, is going to represent a problem. But uh, Well, what's the quid pro quo on that? Uh, they've terminated that agreement. You haven't made a new one yet. Canadians won't be fishing in Alaskan waters for halibut. What's the quid pro quo? What do we get? Well, then the Americans wouldn't fish for ground fish uh, off the Canadian coast. That's not nearly as valuable, is it? Well, it now. comes out to roughly the same. Ground fish produces a bit more plant employment, has therefore more value added. It comes out to a roughly 50-50 proposal if we go ahead with the proposed agreement. Fishermen, uh, halibut fishermen are complaining right now, and I want to talk to you about what is believed to be the failure of your buyback program. They believe that if they're banned from the halibut with the halibut licenses, they won't be able to fish other than ground fish. Will you give these halibut boats salmon licenses in Canadian waters? I'd have to check the arithmetic. I think it's 25 or 24 out of 46 have salmon licenses now. In other words, they can go into the salmon fishery without hesitation. If you wiped out their, if their halibut fishery is wiped out, though, it's almost essential for you to be generous and say you can fish salmon in Canadian waters. I made it clear to them last night that uh, the, we always, when we discuss the halibut fishery, because it was the one hostage to fortune for the Canadian fishermen. There's no doubt it was the most visible area that we could be wiped out by an American extension of jurisdiction. We always said that in the period of, of readjustment that we would put in a uh, program to help them either convert to other fishery because they don't want to retire from the fishery. These are professional fishermen. I laughed at one who said he'd go on welfare, mind you, I must confess, but I would think they have a reasonable case to say if we can't fish halibut in American waters, you've got to give us salmon licenses in Canadian waters. Well, they have certainly a good argument, but also while they are doing the changeover, getting a different type of gear, etc., I think we would help them financially. You know, I, we don't want to see a group of fishermen wiped out. Now, uh, in a minute or two, we're going to discuss the, the herring. Don't you feel you'd like to buy a herring skiff, get a license, and get in on the bonanza for maybe the last year? Well, I don't know what pension plan I'll have, but certainly if I could issue myself a herring saner license on the West Coast or the East Coast, uh, I think I could retire nicely. We'll know that if you get one, you've decided to quit <laughs> politics. <laughs> Romeo LeBlanc on the fisheries problems on the West Coast after this break. Are you the man behind the attack on the Fisherman's Union for its alleged combine, Mr. LeBlanc? No, the combine's investigation takes place without uh, the cabinet even being apprised of it. Not even a little nudge from your corner? No, I, um, I think this is an issue in which it's, you know, it's a semi-judicial body, and uh, once the combine's uh, director launches an investigation... Uh, we shouldn't even talk about it. 
Oh, I think we can talk about it, but uh, my problem is I can't really discuss the issue. You can't discuss the issue, except, of course, you might tell me that the Fisherman's Union, in its fishing capacity, is not a certified trade union under your federal laws. Well, the difficulty of um, trying to fit a fisherman who is really, if he has his own boat, a self-employed individual, um, to fit him into a, a bargaining unit uh, is recognized. As you know, the judgment of the Supreme Court on this issue said, well, unless the law is changed uh, to cover this angle, then you have a real difficulty, in, in the, and I'm not a, a labor lawyer. Uh, I must say that um, I recognize that the fishermen should have a right to organize and associate like any other group in this society. You know, on the East Coast, there are two provinces where the law does not allow fishermen to even band together and to negotiate the price of their fish. The one sympathy I have with the Fishermen's Union, one sympathy I have with them, is that they're certainly up against a huge effective combine, quote, combine, unquote, of multinational corporations, aren't they? Well, I think uh, Big if, if international you, companies. If you're going to have large, powerful companies, then the fishermen must have a strong organization in which they can function. Now, some fishermen don't want to belong to an organization. Uh, it's not going to be an easy issue to resolve. No. Now, Herring, uh, there have been some very depressing reports about, I think you call it Herring Yards, meaning the Herring Spoor. Uh, we've, cut the, the, we've cut it down from 80,000 to 60,000 this year. And uh, does, do the prospects look bleak for the continuation of good herring runs? Because everyone's in on the act at a minimum of $1,250 a ton. Selling in San Francisco the other day, herring row for Japan, 2000 American dollars a ton. Are we fishing this out for sheer greed, Mr. LeBlanc? There's no doubt that the, the appetite for the dollars that, that they're getting uh, is pushing the fishermen to take but you control a it. lot of it. You control it. We control it. it, and in fact, we've lowered the quantity which, uh, which is to be taken. But we, we will have, and we are taking a very hard look at this one. I think that there is a danger, you know, and on, on the way over, Wally Johnson and I were discussing this. If somebody were to say we're going to take eggs of salmon on the Adams River because they're more valuable than the flesh, I suspect there would be a hell of a hue and cry. Well, you're looking a little bit at the same situation. Uh, we have to make sure that although the herring roe fishery is a very important fishery, and it represents roughly $100 million, uh, that we don't overdo it. I think we will have to take uh, sterner measures. For example, while this was f fully open a few years ago, uh, everybody and his uncle uh, got a herring uh, skiff. Uh, skiff and a herring license. And uh, the Sinclair report indicates this. We're going to have to take a very hard look. We almost fished it out once before, did we not? You fished well, it out on the East Coast, didn't you? We did it in boat coasts, actually. And uh, one thing about my biologists, a lot of people attack them. Uh, they don't remember that when they predict disaster and it occurs, that they were right. Well, uh, in Jarvis Inlet this year, said he having been carefully briefed, uh, instead of the normal 250,000 yards of spore, there was 417 yards. Might not this be? The last year, for some time, for this, uh, what's the word for it? For this big, wealthy Japanese herring roll fishery. I don't think we necessarily have to go to total elimination. I think what we have to do is to re decrease and take a very cautious approach. I might say that we have taken um, the lowest recommendation of the scientists on the herring roll fishery. Uh, we have been, I consider, quite cautious. But I want to make sure that, especially when prices are very good, and it's really, it's not the survival of, uh, of fishermen that's at stake, it is really the level of their income. Now, if you can make a good income with, say, 40,000 tons, instead of 60,000 tons, I think we have to look at it. And if we're wrong, I prefer us to be wrong on the side of caution on that one. I'm uh, talking of too many, do you still say, and I believe Sinclair does, and do you still believe that here we are after all these complicated buyback programs which seem to have slipped into ineffectiveness, too many fishermen chasing too many, too few fish. I'm not sure it's the number of fishermen only. It's I the gear. It's the gear, the expense. In other words, if you buy um, a simple vessel, you're probably going to pay $80,000. 40 or 45,000 will represent the, the license, the, the permit to, to fish. Trafficking and licenses. Well, um, you know, I, I prob the problem I have is I have to live with, with what I inherit as Mr. Davis before me has to inherit what was before him. But 
there's no doubt that the day that we allow what is basically a common property, the license to fish uh, in Canadian waters, that we allow that to, to start growing in value, uh, we introduced, I think, a very dangerous uh, situation. But is that not the case right now? It is. I mean, uh, I'm told, Mr. LeBlanc, that uh, the big seiners, you can't get a, a big seiner built in British Columbia. All the yards are filled. And instead of just a simple transfer of a five-ton capacity from one boat to a new boat, the people are building huge million-dollar seiners. And they're the people you're worried about, surely. No, well, the, the absolute number of tons does not increase. But the fact is that if you buy two medium-sized boats, you're allowed to build a, to replace those two by one big one, boat, one uh, representing that same tonnage. Why don't you close that loophole, or do you want to see Sinclair, big efficient boats only? No, I, no. If you look at the history of the fishery on the East Coast, in fact, I'm under great attack because I won't go for freezer trawlers, as a as a great venue that is being promoted there. No, I think we have to um, to. Um, except one f distortion that has occurred. The fishermen, having invested a great deal, obviously they need a great deal of fish to meet their payments. They roam up and down the coast. Sinclair in his report says that we should really stop this, that we should look at zones, that you have a license to fish up north or one down south, but you don't constantly crisscross. Now, there's Do you like that recommendation? I think it has a lot to be said for it because it reduces possibly the pressure on the resource. You see, our only job in this is to try to protect the fish from everybody's appetite. Mm. How do you arrive at it in a fair way? Well, Sinclair is going to have to be discussed with the industry. Well, We've already started. You're not committed to Sinclair. For I instance, there's 2% tax on the catch value. Some of the PTA people think that's a good idea because they're making a good living. The little guys fight it incredibly hard because you've already increased the license fees by God knows how many percent over the last 10 years. Well, the little guy who catches much less fish would in fact not do what he's doing now, which is paying pretty well the same license fee as the guy who's catching a lot. So in that sense, there may be more fairness. Are you committed to any of Sinclair's recommendations yet? Committed, no, because I really want to get the reaction of the industry and we started. I think Sinclair has to be read very carefully. I think if groups start taking Sinclair and say, well, he hurts me a little bit there, or he hurts me a little bit here, then we'll never have a report which stands up. More with Romeo LeBlanc. Telephone calls not this time, but perhaps the next time after this break. Mr. LeBlanc, you almost get away from me on this kind of control of the number of boats. So at the moment, you're thinking, fish boats we're talking about, of course, you're thinking that maybe, and it is a single recommendation, that if you confine fishermen to zones, how would that reduce the number of, fish, of ships in the fleet? I don't think it'll boats. reduce the number of ships. It might reduce the pressure. What is happening is that you have a half-day opening or a day opening somewhere, and everybody rushes down and rather a helter-skelter operation. Now that is going to be resisted uh, by some segments, those who are very mobile and who can roam up and down the coast. But there are a lot of small fishermen who don't have that, that ability and who basically, if allowed a modest amount of fish in the zone which is close to home, uh, would find that that's quite all right, thank you. So we'll have to balance that off. You know, we're always in the middle of a whole lot of conflicting interests. And these conflicting interests defend themselves uh, the way they know best, which is to uh, get public opinion aroused right, and you've got the presenting a rather let's narrow point of view, I must say. Let's look at time. them. The multinational corporations who keep a low profile in the media, right? They own or finance the big seners. Uh, they take the bulk of the catch in, in salmon, don't they? The bulk, I'd have to ask Wally Johnson what percentages we're talking about. But you know, the other uh, gear types, uh, gill netters and trawlers, take a fair number of salmon too. Before I come to that, though, I, if I don't speak on behalf of worried sports fishermen, I'll get crucified. Mm -hmm. Sinclair recommends a $10 yearly license fee for tidal water fishermen on the coast. Would that apply if you accept it to both coasts, east coast and west coast? I suspect the uh, license, sports license uh, for Atlantic salmon is considerably higher. I'd have to check. I oh, they have one now there? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. oh this would be a first. In it other words, they're tougher, harder done to than we are. Well, in the Atlantic salmon, which is badly depleted, uh, they are, in fact. But, you know, I would not introduce a uh, sports uh, license unless there was a good reason for it. And, by the way, a lot of sportsmen want one. 
They say that if they pay a fee, that they then have a voice at the table where decisions are made, and I think they're right. What, what is the more is this is a recommendation. They say that Sinclair doesn't know what he's talking about. Oh, uh, I on barbless hooks, because you can't mooch with, with herring, which you catch on a barbless hook, for salmon, without a barb. Or the herring is a way. Is that, have you ever fished for salmon? I fish, but I'm, uh, I recognize my modesty in this area is perfectly justified. I'm not a good sports fisherman. Will you look very closely at the barbless business? <laughs> I will. And secondly, I've done a little fishing myself. But before we go any further, if Sinclair says $10, frankly, I don't think the, the number of dollars is important. And I've always suggested we should look at $5 a year, three years for 10. In other words, do a bit of Lotto Canada thrown in. We might throw a Lotto ticket or something. Well, it's not a bad idea. Now, the 18-inch limit. I know by my own fishing experience, you put fish back, you catch four little ones and put them back, they're dead. The 18-inch limit seems even to an amateur like me to be quite senseless for sport fishing. There are conflicting views on that. Uh, that will be part of the discussion we're going to have to, to go ahead with. Now, I want to speak to you on behalf of several hundred troller men who on the west coast of Vancouver Island, who feel very strongly indeed that they, in 78, were discriminated against by your fisheries people, in that there was a closure on the west coast uh, after fishing for sockeye on conservation grounds, they claim, but that, and they couldn't get in touch with the fisheries people at all. They closed at 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon, couldn't even get the Tanu or the Howie or any of the boats finally got them through Bull Harbor Radio. And then, to their astonishment, and they're still steaming about it, they've asked the NDP, who are going to raise it in the provincial legislature, the inside passage is opened up for the big boys, the packers, the saners. And they walk away with $100 million worth of sockeye, while the trollermen, the real fishermen, you might say, are sitting out on the West Coast not knowing what to do until they're finally allowed inside and they get the tail end of the run. They accuse your people of discrimination against West Coast trollermen. Have you had this charge before? I've heard it, and uh, the man, I think, who is with me, Wally Johnson, the regional director, probably can bring answer him in. that one. We'll bring in Mr. Johnson to talk about that, and then we'll be taking telephone calls to Mr. LeBlanc after this, and take my break a little early, after this break. <laughs> Now, with the minister and myself now is Wally Johnson, the Director General. Director General? Yeah. Is that a new kind of title? Yeah, yeah. Oh. All title and no money, Jack. <laughs> Director General <laughs> of the Pacific <laughs> Region. Right. Now, quite seriously, two troller men drove all the way from Albany to see me yesterday, and they were still steaming from last year. And they really feel, Mr. LeBlanc, Mr. Johnson, that there has been descript the accuse your department of ineptitude, if not worse because of what happened in uh, August the 12th, 1978. Do you remember the incident? Absolutely. What's your version of it? Mr. Well, uh, what happened? My version, let me give you the facts. Right. At that time, we and the International Salmon Commission were predicting a lower than expected amount of sockeye coming in. 3.4 million. 3.4 million. And, uh, you know, the, the trollers are outside. They're out where they get the first crack at the fish. Who can line? Right. But, you know, the, the previous year, they got the first crack at the pink salmon, and they caught uh, as many pink salmon as the whole net fleet in, in combination. So uh, here was a real problem uh, and concern. You know, sockeye is the traditional uh, species uh, caught by uh, net fishermen, saners, and gill netters. It's been the heart of their income for years. And uh, it was only in the uh, uh, about 1974 when trollers first found a method where they could catch sockeye salmon. Mm -hmm. But they're out there and get the first crack at them. Well, you know, we have a lot of customers to try and please. Uh, we can't say that the man out on the line getting the first crack can take them all. And that was a simple matter. Uh, they had been catching quite a number of sockeye. The prediction was still that there were going to be a rather small number. So we closed the fishery. Uh, but then you opened it on the inside for the saners. When uh, the fish really started showing up 
and a lot of the fish last year came around the north end of Vancouver Island and then they started showing in much greater numbers. So we opened to the Saners, yes, and we opened again to the trollers as well. So what was really the problem there you had was that your bio biologists estimate of the amount of fish in that sockeye, Fraser sockeye run was not 3.4, finished up at many more millions. Yes. Because the Saners picked up 5,300,000 fish, as I see the figures. Right, and uh, you know, I mean, uh, I our, our estimates are just estimates until the, the fish show up. The, you know, the proof's in the pudding once they're there. See, I think what their problem is, the troller men, and I mm -hmm. really admire these guys, is that they saw three million fish come and they took the 600,000. And yet when it got around to Saners, you had, your estimate was wrong. And there was much more in the way of salmon to be caught. So they therefore felt that it was really a conspiracy on the part of the department to give it to the big multinationals with the Sanus. How would you respond to that? Well, uh, you know, hindsight is great. If we had known there were that many fish, it wouldn't have been unnecessary to close the trawler. You'd have left it open. We'd have left it open, yes. Oh. And you know, uh, I wonder, Jack, you're talking about the multinational uh, Saners. You know, 90% of the seine boats on this uh, coast are owned by individual fishermen. All banked mortgage to the big companies, many of them, aren't they? There's 8% of the fleet of Saners, right? Am I right in that? 8%? I'm not so good in figures as I Well, uh, yeah, roughly 8% of the number of boats, yes. Anyway, on that particular occasion, they felt you'd pulled the dirty by closing it at 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon, and they had the most awful job to try and get hold of any of your people. Finally got them through Bull Harbor Radio to find out what was happening, because their complaint was, is it conservation or is it allocation? And they got a couple of different answers. So it was really first conservation, and then allocation. Yes, indeed. And you let them come round, but of course they can't all get round to the inside to get the share. Will it happen again? Well, you know, uh, who am I to say nothing will ever happen again? Uh, you know, uh, look, we're faced with a lot of users of the common property fish that belong to the people of Canada. Mm -hmm. And naturally, everyone would like to take them all. Mm -hmm. The Saners would like to take them all, the gill netters would like to take them all, the trollers would like to and take yet, them and all. And you've got members of the public and myself are very much concerned that this rush for the herring, because of the economic state of any province at the moment, you might let them take too much. Well, we don't let them. There is a quota, and then after it's reached, it's closed off. But I mean, your quotas might be wrong. Well, you see, uh, we make estimates. It's, it's like with the salmon. We've estimated the number of herring we expect. But when the herring are now beginning to show up right off the spawning grounds, we have charter boats and we have our own boats out there with echo sounding gear. Mm -hmm. We're sampling and now we're seeing what's showing up and we will fish according to what is showing up. If yeah. only half as many fish show up, maybe we won't have any opening in certain areas. Oh, you'll just close it down. But isn't it quite funny, this uh, herring a few years ago was how much a ton? They well, I remember nothing. when it was $20 a ton. And that the was with the reduction fishery. And now here we are at 1250 and mm. 1400 and 1500 and $18 a ton. It's really too good a bonanza for you not to let the fishermen get the maximum. Well, I suppose you have to make a judgment if... Uh, it's the same with um, a lot of other fisheries. Uh, as long as there was enough fish, for example, to do fish meal, everybody was doing fish meal. That's right. Suddenly the thing went belly up and we had to uh, correct our perception of it, including those, by the way, who lost a fair amount of money when the fish oh, yeah. in the bottom fell out. Uh, you know, the fishery on the West Coast is probably the most complex management fishery that there is, you know, your opening season, because everything depends on how, how much you let escape to reproduce. Okay, just to, just to simplify things. The negotiations in the West Coast will be some time before you come to a position where you can settle face to face or go for arbitration on the boundaries. On the boundaries, yes. Be another six months. Oh, I think I may be optimistic, but uh, if we have a good fisheries agreement, one that both sides can live with, then the boundary issue loses some of its sharpness as an issue. On the halibut, we've got notification of the end, but you're still trying to negotiate a Canadian participation in the halibut fishing in Alaska. We went to Alaska to negotiate for a phase out over two years instead of an abrupt termination, which they are perfectly entitled to do. You know, I was looking at a program, I think it was this morning, and there seemed to be the view that somehow, you know, Canada could continue the halibut fishery of Alaska. 
Well, we can't continue in their zone any more than they can con to continue in ours unless it's part of an agreement. When the agreement dies and they give us notice, it's game over. Well, unless we want to put something on the table to negotiate, then there is no negotiation possible. Mr. LeBlanc, how come I haven't mentioned the 200-mile limit? Nothing on that? Everything okay? It's okay. I think it's on the East Coast, it's showing dramatic results. The increase is really quite phenomenal. and uh, That's a long way away. How's well, the West Coast? Well, it's, it's important. On the West Coast, I think in the ground fish, we have some room for improvement. The stocks will recover. But uh, you're a little less dependent on the 200-mile zone here than we were on the East Coast. Questions to Romeo LeBlanc and perhaps Mr. Johnson, too. Director General of the Pacific Region of the Fisheries Department, still called Fisheries? Fisheries and Ocean soon. Be fisheries and ocean. Yes, the law is before Parliament now. That's that's a nice, it's a nice title. We got three oceans what is in it Canada. In French, pêche et océan. After this break. Well, I got to confess, gentlemen, I've exhausted my knowledge of the fishing industry. Absolutely, totally exhausted it. Well, I'm surprised how well you were briefed on the business of the trawlers. You obviously took a quick lesson. Oh, I was very impressed by these young guys, and I was quite prepared to hate Mr. Johnson. And if, if you underestimate it again, we'll hate you all over again. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, Jack? Yes. Yes. I've got a few points here I'd like to bring up. Uh, are, you, are you a fisherman? Yes, I am. Okay, go at them. Okay. Uh, these boats that are being uh, taken out of Alaska, there's many of them originally that were subsidy boats uh, by the government. There was a subsidy given to them to build these boats. There's some that, uh, well, I can't substantiate it, but I've heard that had A licenses and sold them and received C licenses to fish halibut only in Alaska or wherever, they've already made their money on that A license. Then also, <clears throat> another point is, on the uh, C licenses for packing, <clears throat> Right. No limit on those at all. Uh, it seems that to anybody can go and apply for one. An A license boat can pack, but a packing boat can't fish. Uh, I don't know. It, it just seems like there's a <laughs> there's no organization there at all. Here's a caller that's afraid of a ripoff. If he's right that some of these halibut boats got had A licenses, sold them, got C licenses for halibuts, subsidized into the bargain, is that conceivable? Well, you know, there was a subsidy program uh, some years ago, and a lot of boats on our coast, uh, uh, lots of them who aren't halibut fishermen, were subsidized as well. Now, the, the, the matter of a sea license, you know, everyone has a sort of sea license uh, in addition to uh, their A license or B license or whatever license. That's the general purpose license. That's why you find most anyone, when the salmon fishery's over, they're out taking some prongs or, uh, uh, you know, a variety of things that there's no limited entry on. Mm -hmm. You must admit, these li this licensing <coughs> business, you really need to start from scratch, don't you? Well, that's why, uh, you know, it took Sinclair, what, well over a year to See, try and pull out the lines and to arrive at some suggestions. He for seems to make some, some sense when he talks about licensing the gear, doesn't he? That would give you a better control mm -hmm. on what was fish, doesn't it, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning, Jack. Gentlemen, yep. Mr. Minister, I uh, have a couple of questions concerning the Coquitlam River. Dr. Johnson probably knows... Uh, oh, well, I'm on fishing this morning. Keep your questions short on the Coquitlam River. Much. Well, the, the, the thing is, uh, everybody's concerned about fishing quotas, etc., but I'm concerned with the salmonoid enhancement uh, uh, on the quotas that uh, of deleterious material, sand, silt, gravel that go into a spawning stream uh, without fisheries doing anything about it. Well, <laughs> quickly on that one, we are doing something about it. We strengthen uh, the Fisheries Act to deal with the what we call the habitat destruction, that is the spawning grounds destruction. And uh, there are cases going, moving through the courts now. I think it's quite impressive to see that gradually the courts are recognizing... You mean people with bulldozers and rivers? The bulldozers, but also bad uh, construction and bad logging practices where uh, soil is washed into the river in a, in a freshet or in a heavy rain, and there you are. You've got a real problem. What about the Coquitlam River? Can you give me the score on that, Mr. Johnson? Well, on the Coquitlam, it's been a problem for many, many years. Is that the Gravel River? Yes. Uh -huh. And anyway... Uh, uh, I would only say that we are looking very hard at this, and as soon as we have what we consider adequate 
evidence to stand up in court will be laying charges. The only reason I call in, Jack, is that because for many, many years these people have said that they're looking hard at it and how very hard at it and nothing ever happened. Well, until September 1977 or 78, we did not have the legal powers that we now have given by unanimous vote of parliament. And we are building, but if you go to court with a case that is not very well uh, proven, what happens, you get thrown out and that becomes a precedent uh, to weaken the legislation. But you're planning charges when you have enough evidence on the Coquitlam River. Do I get the message? Absolutely. Thank you. Go ahead from Victoria. Go ahead from Victoria. Speak up a little, please. Oh, can you hear me now? Right. Well, it's refreshing to see a, a uh, member of the federal cabinet that is straightforward as, as your minister there this morning. But I, I wondered if, uh, if any of you three could tell me uh, how much of the processing of uh, fish uh, on both... We got problems with you. Hello? Yeah, well, just speak up, will you please? Is your television set up by any chance? Pardon? No, no, it isn't. No. Okay, how much of the processing of fish on both what? On both coasts is controlled by the Western Corporation. Um, on the East Coast, um, some in the herring, um, the two largest, the three largest uh, corporations on the East Coast are not uh, Western affiliates, and they're really major ones. Uh, Nickerson National, which is a Nova Scotia company, fisheries product, Newfoundland, and the Lake Company in Newfoundland. Uh, on the West Coast, I'll let Wally take that one. Wally, can you give that answer? Yeah, well, that's uh, BC Packers, uh, and uh, they are the biggest single uh, processor, uh, but, you know, there are lots of others and uh, some of significant The size. big ones are BC Packers and Can Fisco, right? Right, and then you have the uh, co-op. Are the Japanese Rupert. not bought anything yet? Well, you've had uh, seen the report on that, I think. Yeah, that's the Medivinia Corporation, I think. Go ahead from Port Alberni. Where are you? Yeah, right here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, uh, I'm phoning up. I'd like to uh, know where the uh, minister there, or Mr. Johnson, gets his, uh, his information on the when we started fishing, the trawlers started fishing the salmon. He said you said 1974, didn't you, Mr. Johnson? It, it was 1974 when the uh, first uh, significant amounts of uh, sockeye, sockeye were, caught by, were caught by trollers. Do you think he's wrong? Yes, in 1958, it was started, they started heavily fishing them in Blackfish Sound. Okay, and the pink salmon were fished before that, long before that. Well, what's your point apart from that? My point in that is uh, that it's consistently been a troller fishery too. And uh, a lot of the, the fishermen are being left out, totally left out, uh, in the way that the fisheries is moving now. We do not want to destroy the resorts. Neither the seiners, the gillnetters, none of the fishermen want to destroy the resorts. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, <laughs> we also don't want to become extinct ourselves. How much money did you make last year? Last year total? Mm -hmm. Total last year, my gross was roughly $100,000. $24,000 went to deckhands. By the time I got through, I ended up with, with roughly $20,000. But you've got a good boat anyway. Yeah. And a good life. Yeah. Good. Much obliged. Go ahead, please. Yes, Jack. Yes. I'm quite surprised that uh, none of the other fishermen have ever ra raised this point uh, since you've had this on. Uh, it's quite unusual that I'm a gillnetter. And I watch in the summertime when the Americans come up from down the States and uh, they bring their big yachts up and they actually have their own little canning deals and everything else on there. Uh, That's been mentioned ad nauseam, but we'll put it to Mr. Yeah. LeBlanc. Uh, we have some communities in British Columbia which live off uh, the American tourists who bring their own canning plants with them and ship it back south to the border. And I'm sure they smoke it and sell it there too. Doesn't Sinclair make recommendations on this? I can't remember if Sinclair does, but when I came here a couple of years ago and this was raised as an issue, I asked Wally Johnson to do something about it, and he did. But, you know, I have to remind you that I also got a real kick uh, in the shins from the Provincial uh, Government Tourism Department, uh, which immediately uh, said that I was going to ruin the tourist industry, etc. I don't think it's a fact, but uh, sometimes it's pretty lonely out there when you get start getting kicked by a whole lot of people. Uh, Wally, what did you do about it? That was the Campbell River Syndrome, we'll call it, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's just about it, because that's uh, 
where I fished from is out of Cam River. And well, wait till we hear what Wally says about what was done. Okay. Well, last year we put in a regulation that made it illegal to possess more than 25 pounds of canned salmon. So if there are four of you in the trailer, you can take back 100 pounds. Because prior to that, they could can as much as they like as long as they weren't found in possession of more than the daily limit of fish. Is that right? Yes, I heard stories about uh, house trailers almost breaking their springs, <laughs> they're so loaded. I know. And furthermore, Mr. Johnson, they were true stories. Webster, and one more segment of Call to Romeo LeBlanc and Wally Johnson after this break. Go ahead to my experts, political and non-political. Go ahead, please. Yes, Jack. Right. Yes, on this licensing deal on uh, the uh, uh, issuing of licenses. Yes. There's no more licenses issued, and that license are not transferable. LeBlanc just said that he, a little while ago that you can take two and you can build a bigger boat. And they're building, I don't know just how many sane boats, steady. Right. And. Uh, I was asked if you're in a few shipyards about building, getting a boat built, and it would be three years before I could get a boat built. How many licenses have you got? I've only got one. And you've got a Class A salmon license? That's right. And you're going to turn in your old boat, are you? Well, yes. But, you, uh, you'll, will he sell that for a sea license, the old boat? No. What will you do with it? I would have to go on a new boat. And you're going to build a new Sainer when you can, are you? No, not a new Sainer boat. I would have built a new Gillnet boat. Mm -hmm. The tonnage on it was uh, nine and a half ton, and it was cut down to seven ton. How is this allowable? Wally, would you? Uh... Well, uh, I don't quite uh, understand about the cutting out. I, your first point you made, uh, it is true that we stopped the pyramiding of uh, licenses, that is, combining two smaller boats and build one big saner at the time of Sinclair report. The study started. You did that a year ago, but enough enough of that fiddling was mm -hmm. done to get to fill the shipyards. Well, and uh, there's nothing to stop anyone. You see, uh, a saner, if he decides he wants to build a new boat, is free to do it as long as it's the same size. And of course, the uh, the income tax system, where, which allows them to write off the boat in three years, uh, encourages them to do that. Yeah, three years—that's early depreciation because of the gamble, I suppose, mm -hmm. in building a fish boat at mm -hmm. all. But are you impressed with uh, Sinclair's recommendations of non-transferable licenses? It's a very deep departure because what has happened is a lot of uh, licenses have really become a bit of a retirement fund. And it's going to be a real difficult one to uh, grapple with. I still think we have to do it. I, we said earlier in the program, this is a property which belongs to the people of Canada. You should be licensed to fish while you are using it. But maybe at one point, a young man wanting to get in, when you retire... Maybe that's the kind of unpopular thing you should put in now in, <coughs> in the likelihood that you're defeated <laughs> on yeah. other issues, because in, a, in, a, in an election year, you wouldn't bring in such a thing, would you? It would be a, it was going to be a difficult one to bring in if uh, we decide to go that route, um, whatever election or non-election year know. it's going to be. But the fact is that a lot of fishermen uh, realize that what has happened to them is that they become mortgaged way above their heads uh, for a boat whose value is inflated artificially. Mm -hmm. uh, this might bring the pressure and the value, uh, the exaggerated value, down. Is it correct that you do plan to reshape the entire license system once you've studied and consulted with the industry on the Sinclair Report? Well, if we can come to a reasonable amount of agreement with all representatives of the industry, we should make some changes. You know, the old Jean Chrétien principle is valid here. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Mm -hmm. uh, we will have, if we want to really shape up the, uh, the fishery, uh, to arrive at a large degree of agreement on what should be done, and not only do the popular ones. But it won't be easy, I tell you. Go ahead, please. Yes. On international negotiations to Romeo. Right. Go ahead. Yes, uh, Mr. Blabanc. Uh, yes. <coughs> uh, you may not agree with me, but it seems to me that when you're negotiating with uh, the Americans, that uh, fisheries are trade bait. What I'm saying is that uh, you'd give our fish away to convince Americans to buy 
for instance, our oil and gas. Sí. Instead of using the only thing that we have to negotiate with, uh, uh, with any strength, cut the taps off until they give us a fair deal on our uh, uh, West Coast uh, fisheries. Uh, deal here. Well, I reject completely trading one industry against another. You know, the day that the BC fishery or the East Coast fishery is in the balance against the automobile industry, uh, you and I are going to have some problems. And uh, I would certainly not uh, in any way c um, uh, agree with putting fish against wheat or against oil or one of those against fish. I think it's the worst way to go. Uh, you have to look at negotiation between, well, basically between fisheries interests. And usually you'll find that you might have a more reasonable agreement in the long run than if you try to uh, peddle fish against um, some other uh, well, interests. You, you don't think the, the, the kind of blackmail type negotiating would succeed at all with the United States or anybody else? I think it's a sure course to disaster, and frankly, as Minister of Fisheries, I think it's a course for disaster for fisheries. Go ahead, please. Where are you? Yes, sir. Uh, I am an Indian fisherman. Yes, sir. And, uh, I was very disappointed the other day uh, when uh, Mr. Webster chose not to invite an Indian organization representing uh, Indian fishermen uh, when he had his program on the other day. My apologies, sir. I overlooked it. Uh, sir, the question I'd like to ask is this. Uh, as, as you're aware, just about all Indian communities on the coast depend entirely on the fishing industry to make their livelihood. It's the only thing they have to improve themselves both economically and socially. And the central report is designed to uh, eliminate the marginal fishermen. And most Indian people are marginal fishermen. Do you, uh, Mr. Minister, recognize the Native Brothers of BC as the spokesman for Indian people who are involved in the fishing industry and uh, who speak out on behalf of Indian fishermen? Yes, I recognize the spokesman of the Indian fishermen, and also I recognize uh, the place that the Indian fishermen should have I in our resource. As you know, uh, we've had over the years the uh, Indian Fisheries Assistance Plan, which I think has gone some way uh, in solving some of the problems. Uh, <laughs> I might tell you that the Salmon Enhancement Program does make and does make room uh, for Indian participation, not only in the fishery, but in fact in the uh, uh, development and maintenance of certain facilities. You know, I want to see the Indian people involved uh, increasingly in the fishery. Frankly, I hope we can exorcise the devil of the food fishery and arrive at a good management of that fishery because I think it, it tends to create a negative climate in which we're trying to solve other problems with the uh, native people. I think, in fact, uh, if we can arrive at a you know, we're only interested in conserving the fish for the future. If we can arrive at a way to do it with all segments of the industry, including the Indian food fishery, uh, I think we will have gone a very, very long way. May I ask this caller a question? Are, have you got the same fear as the West Coast trollermen? Yes, that the small it. troller and the gill netter are almost bound to be squeezed out? Is that your fear? Uh, yes. Well, I can only say this to you. If you look at uh, what I've said over the last four and a half years and what I've done over the last four and a half years, uh, I have a very, very deep awareness that the fishery, you know, exists for a lot of little guys who have no alternative and, in fact, who can earn a very reasonable living with uh, using a resource which belongs to all the people of Canada. I'm not one of those who thinks that the as we say in French, au plus fort la poche, the strongest, the spoils. Uh, I, uh, you know, the Fisheries Council of Canada is uh, attacking me more than the fishermen's organization. That must say something. Would you hold on a second, please? I want to speak to you. Uh, perhaps we can get you on the air sometime with the Native Brotherhood to speak on fishing. If you give Linda your name and address, I'll talk to you later. Will you speak to that gentleman? One last question, Mr. LeBlanc. My thanks to Wally Johnson. Uh, election in May? Oh, I hope it's in May. Uh, New Brunswick, we're ready to go, and we'll fight, and we'll fight hard. Uh, to the victor, the spoils, in uh, French. Au uh, plus fort la poche. How would you say <laughs> to Joe Clark, the spoils? <laughs> Almost certain, isn't it? Oh, I don't think so at all. I think we're going to, you're going to see a tough campaign. It's going to be a very difficult campaign for us. But uh, I think we've shown in the last few months that we have uh, resources to uh, come back and come back fighting. I've only one thing to say. No comment, and that's not for publication. 
My thanks to Rumi LeBlanc, Wally Johnson, Director General of the Pacific Region. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you. Next day, uh, we're going to meet some of my best friends at UBC. <laughs>
and that we're telling the high schools and the students what kinds of courses they have to take to get in. We also do have close liaison with the English teachers in the secondary school, and that we are working to try to improve it. But we're not going to lower our standards. We're going to raise them, and we hope that the secondary schools will adjust to it. In other words, just by pressure and influence. It's by pressure and influence. Why couldn't we have academic entrance exams for all of the children of British Columbia to meet the same standards for the positions here? Well, when I went through this university, we did. We are looking at that problem right now, Jack, and that our Senate will probably be bringing forth some recommendations along that line, particularly in some of the basic subjects like English and mathematics. But you have a faculty member right here by the name of McGeer. That's the Celebrated correct. Patrick McGeer. Now, could he not just lay down that there would be um, province-wide entrance examinations so that everyone would have an equal chance to come to these hallowed halls? The minister could not impose the entrance standards to the university. He could make recommendations to us, but the university sets its own admissions. You're standards. still the boss. We're still the boss. If your that. caliber of entrance is low, it's your fault. It's our fault, but I want to reassure you, Jack, that our standards by 1981 will be probably the highest in Canada. Now. I will put on my other hat as a, as a backer of any Proposition 13 that comes yes. along, right? You're always complaining you don't get enough money. Surely you've finished building and expanding on this priceless site now. No, we're really not finished expanding in terms of our buildings. As you know, at the end of the war, we did cope with the influx of veterans, and we went from roughly 2,500 students overnight to about 10,000. Today, we're over 21,500. And so our physical plant is deficient, but Larry McKenzie brought in 300 army huts to deal with that. We still have 100 of them. That approximately half of all the buildings out here, Jack, the monies for them have come from private citizens and foundations, mm -hmm. not from the provincial government. So we do have a serious shortfall of uh, buildings out here. We are, our army huts, for example, have probably seen more activity in the fight against ignorance than the fight against uh, Nazi Germany. That as far as the faculty goes, uh, that we did overexpand there and our need is to still add additional faculty so that this university will probably, in a short while, could potentially be the best in Canada. And that's my aim. That's the third time you said that. I'm yeah. sure you'll succeed if you live no. long enough. No, oh, no, no, no. With respect, deference, and humility. But when you're talking about the increased standards does and the tighter monies, and money is tight enough. Yes, I'd agree with you on that. Uh, surely that must mean that to get back to more of a cream of the crop, you're going to drop from 21,000 to a smaller number of students over the years. No, I don't think we'll drop at this university. We may hover around in the next decade around 20,000. I'm convinced that students really like a challenge. I'd like to know where you're getting this $250,000, which you're using for scholarships. Well, the provincial government has always told us that we can carry money over under certain conditions, and so just because we have money here, we don't spend it. And so that we do have the fiscal breaks right around the university, and so if there are net savings, and it's just one-shot money for one year, we carry them over into the next year, and that seems a worthwhile place to put it, so that this university will not deprive any needy student student of coming here. You're not going to slap up the fees on top of this? Well, uh, on that, we are actively looking at that. No decision has been made to on that. To put them up? To put them up, yes, and that will always produce uh, a little excitement amongst the student body here because from their viewpoint, they would like them low. That our fees are probably one of the lowest in all Canada, however. But uh, we haven't come to the tenure track. In all the people you have here on the faculty staff, there must be somebody you'd really like to get rid of, and there's not a thing you can do about it because of tenure. It's difficult. It's <laughs> very difficult that uh, basically you can fire a professor for cause, but that you have to go through a very detailed procedure, and it's hard to do. Okay, my next bigoted question. What, uh, what is the proportion of non-Canadians on your faculty staff? Not that we shouldn't hire the best, Dr. Kenny, We'd from wherever they come, providing Canadians have been given equal opportunity to apply, going back a few years. Well, you'll be pleased to know, Jack, that you have chased me on this issue more than once, and so this past fall, we did make a survey of all of the faculty at this university, and interestingly enough, we're right at the Canadian average, namely that 70% of our faculty happen to be Canadian citizens. And that's not a bad average. Remarkably good. 
not a bad average. I remember when it was 48% Canadian, and I did nag them. Continue with our walk around at UBC and meet some of the brighter people and some of my best friends after this break. How did he get in here? Don't even mention his name. He's got no right to be here whatsoever, any way, shape, or form. Continue our walk about at UBC. We're going to look at some of the useful things which might even make money out of our vast investment in education. The invention of the Molly battery by Rudy Herring and Mr. Stiles and this and that, and you'll hear all about it now. Eureka! I have found him. Dr. Rudy Herring of the Department of Physics. Yeah. Rudy, bring, what are you doing with your hands in there? Oh, I'm in the process of putting together one of our new Molly batteries. Uh-huh. And, and why have you got your hands in there to do that? Oh, well, uh, it turns out that in order to make this battery, you have to put it together. You can't do it out in air. You have to use an argon atmosphere, and this box here is filled with argon. And Enough. So what do you call? Here is a sample of a cell of your invention, correct? Yeah. Yes. What do we call it? Well, it's called a molybdenum disulfide lithium battery. We'll call it a Molly battery. Right, right. And will this do wonders for the electronic age or what? I hope so. I hope so. Who invented it? It was invented here at UBC. The original invention was by a co-worker of mine, Jim Stiles, and myself. And yourself. Now, where and when and how can it be used? Well, you could use it wherever you need a rechargeable battery. This, this could start with hearing aids and go all the way up to electric cars. The same, you can make all kinds of batteries, different size batteries out of this material. You mean that this could be a tiny battery for my hearing aid? Sure. And I'd recharge it at night? Sure. I'd never have to buy another battery? Well, you wouldn't have to recharge it every night, but let's say once a week or whatever. You'd or recharge I could, it. And I could use it in my electric car? Yes. Yes. And, and there's no acid in it? There's no acid. In fact, the final version of this battery, although these ones we're holding here, you can take them apart, but the final versions are hermetically sealed. They're welded shut, and there's no leakage, there's no acid, there's no gas, nothing. Now, there are two forms of this battery in the world today. Yes. This one here, invented at UBC by Stiles and Herring. Right. And the other one where? At Exxon in the United States. Exxon? Exxon. You've got pretty tough competition if Exxon are in in the act, have you not, uh, yeah. Dr. Herring? That's right, they're big competitors. Is yours a better battery than theirs? Well, I think so. Why? I'll tell you one reason. Uh, the, the material that's in the Exxon version of this battery is a material that doesn't occur naturally in the world. they got to make it. You've got to make it. Whereas the stuff we're using is, I can show you a bucket of it outside. It, 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 it's molybdenum disulfide. It's a very common mineral in the Earth's crust. L listen, and we've got mountains of molybdenum. lots of it in BC. That's in right. BC? That's right. And now, that's the stuff we're using in that battery. How close are you to commercial development of the Styles Herring Molly battery? Well, uh, that's going on right now in a new company downtown, which Styles is vice president of. And it's, it's being pursued in collaboration with uh, BC Hydro and the Tech Corporation, Canadian mining company. Yeah. And, of course, UBC has an interest in the patents. Who collects the money? You, Stiles, no, Herring? Not I, <laughs> but presumably UBC will get it, sure. Listen, quite a breakthrough. I hope so. Yeah. Recognized throughout the world. I hope so. Will I see it working again somewhere? Well, we can show you one working outside, sure. And we'll certainly have one working at open house when people come through. Rudy, where's your hometown in BC? Caslow. Imagine a man no. from Caslow being a part of the invention of a new battery. Just goes to show you, we're not all Americans, Jack. <laughs> Thanks, Rudy. Well, gentlemen, here we are in the engineering something or other at UBC, getting ready for open house. And what do we have here? Electric vehicle. An electric vehicle. Right. Open the door. Okay. <laughs> It's a funny way to open the door, I might tell you. Now, why will this car win at uh, an exhibition in Detroit in August? The, the prize for the best energy conserving vehicle from universities all over North America. Well, we've designed it for uh, good aerodynamics. It's using an electric motor, which is very efficient to begin with. We're not using an internal combustion engine. And we're also using a computer to control the, the way the motor operates. 
and that way we can increase the efficiency of the way it up. Now, uh, this is not the first uh, uh, primitive vehicle, <coughs> the first Thank experimental you. vehicle uh, put out by UBC Engineering, is it? No, it isn't. There's the Wally Wagon, which is, is similar, except it was powered by liquid natural gas and had a regular gasoline-type engine and just used a different fuel. Now, how many batteries have you got in here? Uh, we have about 50 cells for about 100 volts. 100 volts. How long will it run? Uh, probably about 50 miles. 50 miles. At what speed? 45 um, miles an hour. 45 miles an hour. Cost? This car has cost $200,000 over the last four years. How much? 200000 How much? 200000 You'll never sell that in downtown Vancouver at $200,000 a vehicle. We're not selling prototypes, but uh, the ve a vehicle like this would cost around 6000 approximately. Why are you not using the um, Stiles Herring UBC Tiny Molly battery? Well, we've been talking to them, but they're not ready yet. Their largest battery is about this big now. And they say in about two years they'll have something, and we're sort of gunning for that. We're working at the same time on parallel paths towards using something like that. Now, as graduate students, this is your whole life's work at UBC, is it? No, we also take courses. And we do other work. Do other work as well. How many of you in the engineering faculty work on this vehicle? Well, up to date, there's probably been about 120 students have worked on this project. Uh, this winter, we have about eight people that are working a lot, putting in and a lot of hours. Will it meet the specifications for the contest? Oh, yes. We expect to win first prize in the contest. How much is first prize? Well, there's no, uh, no, no money, money involved. There's lots of fame involved. No right. money. There's going to be 50 universities from all of North America. And we'd like to think that a competition like this, when we bring our ideas to the competition, they'll be uh, like General Motors, Chrysler, all the big car companies and the European car companies will be there. And they will see what, you know, what ideas we've got. Is it, and then compare them with are your ideas, ideas patented have. or will they still? No, no, we don't patent our ideas. But uh, like the Wally Wagon, you remember that won the competition. It's a very similar to competition, 1972. And what, about three years later, a lot of cars started to come out, like the Volkswagen Rabbit, that were quite similar to the Wally Wagon. Oh, oh. Uh -huh. So that's something that we would expect out of this. Two technical questions. What kind of engine? It's a DC shunt motor. A shunt motor. Yes. We've also tried an AC motor in this, but it's a little bit too advanced for the type of... How many, uh, how many uh, milk, uh, how many jugs of water will I need when I want to top up my batteries before I plug it in to charge it for another 50 miles? Most of these systems have an automatic watering system. We just add a little bit of water at the end, and that's about once every two or three weeks. So you have maybe a quarter or two. Have you got that in here? It will, we will have. We won't have it at present. Well, you better win it. If you don't win it in Detroit, don't come home. We'll win. We'll win. I tell you, I was very impressed with these young guys in the engineering and also with the Molly battery. More after this break. Well, now I know that the set of students at UBC nowadays that they're pretty docile. And I want to take you to some of the most docile students out at UBC. And I'm not referring to Dr. Malcolm Tate, who is an expert on ruminant nutrition. Ruminant nutrition. And behind him he's got oh, a dozen of very nice, fat, pregnant looking dorsets, eh, Malcolm? They're hopefully pregnant. What do you mean hopefully? You're not guaranteed here. No, the rounds have been running with them since early January. How big a flock do you have here? 120 breeding ewes. 120 breeding ewes. What do you do with your lambs? I stomach it back as replacement breeders, and uh, others go through Richmond Packers as butcher lambs. Now, there's a lot of folk in Salt Salt Spring Island who want to know all about proper ruminant nutrition. What do you feed them? Uh, the basic diet here, we have no pasture, so we're on a total confinement uh, operation. Uh, the basic diet is alfalfa, and uh, recently we've been using alfalfa cubes as opposed to conventional baled hay. And one of the main advantages of this is that there's essentially no waste with it. And now, are these alfalfa cubes expensive? Currently, it's running about $100 a ton. It's slightly above uh, baled hay. But, but uh, much more convenient. That's right. And the reduction in waste, I feel, will more than compensate. Would you recommend it for the average hobby farmer? Uh, one of the problems at the present time is somewhat limited supply, and uh, I think there are also some problems with uh, quality control. But the product is still a little variable in quality. OK, I have a question for a friend of mine by the name of Ted Ackerman. Yes, don't suppose yes, you, I know that. You know Ted? Yes. His family have been sheep ranching on Salt Spring for close on 100 years, yes. if not more. Um, 
And I keep saying to him, what do I do with the odd case of foot rot? Mm -hmm. Tell me. Oh, that's the $60,000 question. Uh, foot rot is a, is a major problem. And uh, regular foot trimming, keeping the, the, the hooves in good, healthy state, uh, formaldehyde foot baths or copper sulfate foot bath, these all help. And recently, the, there's a vaccine been, been developed, which is a further uh, aid. But should we all methods. should we be dipping sheep? Uh, because by and large, they're not dipped in British Columbia. Uh, we do need to, but we don't. And uh, we have a, a problem with external parasites. The, the sheep ked is the most common one, and I can guarantee that the majority of commercial sheep uh, have a, a ked problem. You dip yours. Uh, we spray, and uh, that seems to keep it under control. And one of them twice a year? At least. Uh, Th these are both uh, foot rot and worms are things that just generally lower the productivity of the sheep. They're not going to kill them, they just lower But the you can tell by the look of the sheep. To some extent. Now, if I might be bold enough to criticize you, when I was in the lamb barn, I noticed you were still using this dreadful method of docking the tails with the elastic band, the rubber ring. Why? Why not? I, I, it's one of these things that, if used properly, there are no problems. I, I've done literally thousands with the rubber rings, and if it's done within 48 hours at birth, no problem at all. Just put the ring on? Put the ring on, and at that time, the blood supply to the tail is quite limited, and it cuts the blood supply off, and the tail drops off. No danger of gangrene? Essentially not, under clean conditions and done young. The problems arise when it's done too late, when the tail's well developed and there's a good blood Is supply. it bad to use the bedizers? That's another method, but you leave an open wound and plus there's an even greater chance of infection. Now, um, when it comes to knackering the ram lambs, you keep your... No, you sell your ram lambs. We sell ram lambs. Uh, most of them will grow fast enough that they're slaughtered before they're five months of age. And uh, we haven't had any problems marketing them. And they grow 10 to 15 percent faster and just about that much more efficiently. They, they, pr they produce a, a leaner carcass uh, as ram lambs compared to uh, castrated. By the way, you're very well dressed for, for uh, working around with sheep. I'm prepared to get into one of those right now. <laughs> Thanks very much, Doc. Well, thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Open house tomorrow, Friday and Saturday at UBC. Linda, tomorrow. Your appearance on W5. Going to be repeated tomorrow morning. That's right. Good idea. Many people missed it on the network. 9 a.m. precisely.